Right, so introduction to biomarkers. So uh, what we're going to do in this section uh, is uh, look at a, just a brief history of clinical biomarkers in cancer, um, the use of biomarkers in clinical practice, and, and maybe um, just talk about the future of uh, biomarker discovery. Um, and then we're also going to have some, uh, after the break, we'll look at measuring how you actually measure um, these, these, um, these features. And, uh, and then we'll have a little um, lecture on, uh, we'll have a, a lecture on alternative splicing. And then just before lunch, we'll go over the, this example study that, um, that we keep mentioning. So um, what is a biomarker? Does anybody have a, a good definition of a biomarker that they want to throw out? Don't be shy. There's no right answer. <laughs> sure. That's an important part, and um, it's something you can measure. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, so I'm just going to flash up some examples now. You can um, tell me, does anybody know what this story is? Um, this is two genes coming together. Um, yeah, that's right. So this is a, this is a, a biomarker for prostate cancer, uh, which is a gene fusion. Um, you've probably seen plots like this. Where's the... Um, person working on a GWAS study, right here, Julie, you've probably seen pictures like this. So this is, uh, this is just a, uh, a plot of um, an associated SNP uh, with, with a particular disease. Um, Blaze, you might know what this is. <laughs> Why don't you tell the group what this is? <laughs> Um, okay, so, uh, and this one is, um, this is the classic, uh, this is one of the most, I think, classic cases of, of biomarker use in clinical, um, in, in, in clinical use right now. This is just showing a um, copy number amplification of HER2, or ERB2, on chromosome 17 in a breast cancer tumor, and uh, what's shown there is just uh, uh, a SNP6, uh, affymetric SNP6 profiling uh, of, of this tumor. And uh, the red um, spike there shows that this is the locus um, that contains this gene, HER2, and you can see that there are just uh, many, many, many more copies of this gene um, in this particular tumor than, um, than would be expected um, normally. And so um, this is a targetable uh, biomarker uh, when it's overexpressed, um, you can make a test for that and, and actually prescribe a therapy accordingly. Um, so this uh, then is actually a, a mutation in, uh, in the gene called P10 uh, in, in, ovarian, in an ovarian cancer. Um, this, is a, this is a real result uh, from, uh, from data that I work with um, where the um, mutations in, um, in certain types of ovarian cancer in P10 are, are uh, well described and, and well known. And, um, and so there it is. So this just gives you a flavor of the type of variety of, of, of biomarkers that um, uh, are out there and, uh, and different measurement technologies that, uh, that go into um, their discovery and their, uh, their analysis. So I just wanted to go over some definitions from um, some places around, around the web. So here's just the Wikipedia uh, definition. So a biomarker is a substance used as an indicator of biologic state. It is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biologic process, pathogenic process, or pharmacologic response to therapeutic in intervention. Uh, so here's something from the Huntington's Outreach Project at Stanford. Um, this, uh, biomarker is a specific biological trait, such as the level of a certain molecule in the body, that can be measured to indicate the progression of a disease or condition. 
this is the human proteome organization. Uh, their definition is biomarker is used to indicate or measure a biological pro biologic process. For instance, levels of a specific protein in blood or spinal fluid, genetic mutations, or brain abnormalities observed in a PET scan or other imaging test. So, so biomarkers don't have to be molecular; they can be from from images or um, uh, other other sources of data. Um, detecting biomarkers specific to a disease can aid in the identification, diagnosis, and treatment of affected individuals and people who may be at risk but do not yet exhibit symptoms. Okay, um, so this is from Lilly trials. Um, a biomarker is a measurement of a variable related to a disease that may serve as an indicator or predictor of that disease. And biomarkers are parameters from which the presence or risk of a disease can be inferred rather than being a measure of the disease itself. So we don't, so what we sometimes use is biomarkers as a proxy. Um, so it doesn't actually uh, indicate the disease itself, but we might have some sort of association. Uh, the Biomarkers Consortium from the NIH uh, defines biomarkers as uh, characteristics that are objectively measured and evaluated as indicators of normal biologic process, pathogenic process, or pharmacological response to the you know, invention. That's, that sounds um, what we've seen before. So, um, so at the end of the day, um, we need a measurable, biomarker needs to be an objectively measurable quantity and we need to be able to infer something about disease from it. So uh, from a clinical perspective, these are indicators for management of care, and, um, and they're often, we want to be able to use biomarkers uh, in, in diagnostics and prognostics and in therapeutic targets. Um, and in basic science, um, biomarkers help us to better understand mechanisms of disease. And so I think that's an important element that actually may, um, may not have been mentioned before, is that actually uh, it helps us to, to understand the disease um, better. So here's some just some types of biomarkers in cancer. We've already heard these terms before, um, but uh, a diagnostic biomarker uh, is uh, used to detect and identify a given type of cancer uh, in an individual. So we can use, use uh, a diagnostic biomarker to help us um, subtype a different uh, different types of cancer, um, and often those subtypes, um, well, sometimes those subtypes uh, may respond preferentially to different therapies, and so these, um, the, it helps to uh, to, to, to di diagnose the, the, the tumors, and that helps indicate management of care. Um, so a prognostic marker uh, would help predict the probable course of disease, so how aggressive is the disease, um, and, uh, and what is the likely outcome of the patient, so given elevated levels of some biomarker, um, how likely is a, uh, what is the prognosis for the particular patient. And then we have predictive markers which actually help us to, uh, uh, to, to determine uh, response to therapy. So uh, here's just a table that I extracted from um, this paper. It's actually written by a group here in Toronto. Um, does anybody know these people actually? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I actually found this to be quite a nice uh, review paper. Um, so, so this is just a, a short list, but um, one of the things to note from this is actually that um, the latest entry on this list uh, is, uh, comes from the 80s. Uh, so the number of new markers that are effectively used in clinical practice um, it recently is actually um, remarkably small. Um, so, so what's listed here, um, and I'll just again highlight the, 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 the canonical examples that um, in breast cancer um, are, are, are HER2, which is uh, ERB2, also known as ERB2, and, uh, and the estrogen receptor. And, and these, are, these are used to actually um, uh, direct uh, uh, chemotherapy uh, in these patients. So why are so few new biomarkers in clinical use? Um, and I'll actually put this out to the class. Um, can, can somebody, can, can anybody uh, give some insight into that or um, have some thoughts about um, why so few, we're making, we're generating lots of data. Um, we're actually making a lot of associations uh, with clinical outcome in, in these data, gen genome-wide association studies, gene expression profiling, um, look, huge copy number, uh, data sets. Now it, we're now into sequencing. Um, so we're generating lots of data. We're actually finding um, 
markers that are associated with outcome, um, but we have very few markers in clinical practice. So please. And with what for that. Any other comments? Please. Yeah, so that's an excellent point. We'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, just about, uh, we have a very large number of features that we're measuring. And we have very few patients that we're usually measuring. So the proportion of features that we're measuring to the number of patients um, is, is really quite large. And um, so we, there may be uh, markers that are um, simply just present in our one cohort, and, but when you actually extrapolate to a large, larger cohort, um, they, they just uh, are, it's not reproducible. Um, so so that's, uh, that's a major issue. Um, any other thoughts on this? Sure, please. Any of the clinicians have any perspective on that? I think it takes time. It's from the lab when you find something that might be really useful clinically, it takes time to get into the mainstream. Even if it's, first you have to validate the proofing across several yeah. types of population, and then you have to be to, to, to show that it, it changes the prognostic when you use it or when you don't use it. So you get to the clinical trials, randomized control trials, you have to see if it's really valuable or not. And among all those markers that are generated, only a few will pass all those filters and at the end and get into the clinical matches. If in the main thing is you are generating all those data right now, but from now to get into the clinical, it usually takes 10, 20 years. Yeah. Right. And um, that's the, my, my main reason why I think that those markers are not getting there. Yeah. Great, great. Um, any other perspective, please? Also, the way studies being analyzed, they identify different clusters of bottom markers. It's really hard to say which cluster is the relevant one in the long term. Right, right. So, so essentially, um, I think that uh, just to summarize what, what was said is that, um, first of all, I mean, this process is very difficult. It's a, it's a really hard process to, to, to try to find a biomarker for clinical use. Um, so second of all is that uh, the signal to noise ratio uh, for most markers is actually really small. So to find a signal out of, um, out of, out of the noise uh, is, is really quite difficult and often it's not reproducible uh, in, in larger cohorts. Another, another uh, item is that it really takes, it does have to go through a lengthy process. And, um, and so, so all those things combined uh, make this actually quite a, difficult, uh, quite a difficult field to actually really gain success. Um, so here's just an example of that, of the, of the actual process. Um, so here's some barriers and challenges uh, to the adoption. So, so we start out in, in basic research. And, uh, and so we can be generating lots of um, measurements uh, from uh, various uh, biological entities, be them proteins or, or transcripts or, or DNA. And, um, and, and we might find some sort of association with, um, with, with outcome. And, uh, but then we need to go through, through um, this process. And this is really where the, the, the difficult uh, part comes in. Um, so, so here's just a figure that um, that I, I pulled out from from this paper here, and um, it's 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 this part here. So a validation study on samples 
from patients with disease and, and healthy control. So, so controlled clinical trials um, take a long time and, and are difficult um, uh, to study. And uh, these are to, on large numbers of patients. This is actually uh, a major, major problem right here. So here's just a, a, a flow chart then of, of what might actually have to take place. So, um, so we start with a patient sample. And, uh, and, and we may have some sort of biomarker uh, identification. Well, the first problem is that, that often um, one of the reasons for re lack of reproducibility is that there's a lack of standards for how you prepare the samples and, and how um, a lot of these are actually retrospective studies that um, you know, the, 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 the samples might have been fixed in very, various different ways um, when they were originally resected from the patient. Uh, and so, so there's a variable, a lot of variability there in terms of uh, actually how the samples are, are prepared. Um, so then, then we might actually get to the point where we have uh, biomarker application. And, um, and so this might help us determine uh, the tumor type, stage, or even grade, uh, for example. Um, it may have an association with pred prediction of survival uh, or, or response to treatment. Um, and, and so we can, we can maybe make those associations in our, uh, in our discovery cohort, um, we, but often that cohort is just too small and, and we have problems with what we call overfitting. So this is a term that um, you should really become familiar with in this field, all the, all the people using um, high dimensional data sets. Um, the problem of having many, many features and few patients um, often means that uh, we could be spuriously finding things that are just present in our in our um, in our actual discovery data set, and they just don't generalize to larger cohorts. And uh, that's actually one of I think that's probably the single biggest problem with with this field is that um, the original cohort discovery cohort sizes. Uh, we've all read a million papers on this, but um, uh, the, the the biggest problem is that it's just uh, the sample sizes are just too small, and uh, yeah. So 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 I think what we're seeing in the literature up until now has been about um, the, the reaching in terms of um, high dimensional data sets, the reaching in, in the hundred or, or hundred to two hundred range. Um, certainly, the paper that we're going to be looking at um, looked at 145. Um, uh, DNA copy number profiles, 118 gene expression profiles, and I think there, there was an overlap of about 106. Um, and so that, that paper um, was published in Cancer Cell. And, uh, but it's still it's a very small, um, a small cohort size. So one of the, um, one of the, the, the goals of, of the breast cancer uh, project that I talked to you about earlier is to really ratchet this up by orders of magnitude. So we're looking at profiling 2,000 tumors. And, um, and, and hoping that actually uh, that, that will really help solve this problem. Um, it's still probably not enough though. Yeah. It, no, I don't think two thousand. Yeah. So, so it, it actually, I think it depends what you're looking for and it depends on, on the kind of design of the study. So is 2,000 enough? Probably not. Um, but what we were, what we we're surmising is that um, this may help um, identify rare Markers that um, are but that would show up as maybe singletons in in uh, a set of hundreds, um, and and you can't really say much about singletons. So something occurs once, and what can you say? But it may it may recur ten to ten to twelve to fifteen times in in a, in a sample size of two thousand, and then you may have some indication that that uh, might be something of relevance. Um, yeah. Right. Otherwise, it will take That's right. Years and years. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So you have multiple. Then you have the then you have the, the top problem, right? So, um, so then you have variable in, in terms of prep, sample preparation. Anna. Right. Right. 
So I have a very rare example, I think, um, that we found a biomarker with four patients. And um, so I'll, I'll, uh, and, and that was that was published um, just recently. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm a bit hypocritical there, but um, at the same time, I think so. If the signal is strong, and, uh, and if the signal is very strong, um, then you need fewer patients. But um, when we're talking about discovery, uh, it, it, this is this is a bit of an issue. Okay. So, so we have problems with overfitting and reproducibility. What I'll, what we'll show in the lab as well is actually um, so uh, there there are details on this in the slides. But essentially, breast cancer um, since about the year two thousand um, uh, has been s spoken about in five gene expression subtypes, um, and uh, and so so one thing is that. Um, uh, if we were to take different cohorts, so 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 what hap what what a group of uh, individuals did um, is 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 to um, build classifiers based on these subtypes. Um, so what we're going to do in the lab is actually try to rediscover those subtypes from the data in the uh, in the chin paper, and and you'll see that um, well you get similar results, but uh, it's not crystal clear, and so uh, so so once we've if you use the the, the classifier, um, is somewhat reproducible, but um, but to actually rediscover the classifier from another cohort is not. So um, it's it's just uh, something to, to bear in mind. Okay, so then uh, uh, finally um, the the need for prospective trials. Um, these are uh, of course uh, I, you know I don't personally have a lot of experience in this, but um, but uh, th this is this is actually required for clinical use, and this is a lengthy uh, and, and expensive process, uh, as has already been mentioned. Okay, so this is all sounding very negative, um, but uh, there, you're here because there's some optimism here. Um, so, so have all the important markers been found? I mean, is it just limited to that 12 that um, I, I showed on on the table? Well, uh, hopefully not. Um, so, so what's happening now is that um, uh, measurements are getting more and more precise. Um, we're moving from uh, hybridization techniques, which give really kind of noisy signals, um, to sequencing, uh, and sequencing is the the highest resolution that we can possibly look at from, from a molecular standpoint. Um, so, there's a lot of activity uh, involved in uh, sequencing cancer genomes, and uh, and Francis is involved, and and and, uh, and more and more of, of, of you, I'm sure, um, will start to be involved in this activity. And I think if I give this workshop in a in a year from now, um, the focus will be much more on this um, than on, on on what we're going to talk about, because um, it's really kind of at, at a point where, uh, well, so far there's only been one tumor genome. Uh, Tumor, full tumor, tumor genome published, and uh, and then we have our own paper on four transcriptomes, but um, uh, but so that's it for now. But I think what we're going to see in the next year is, is we'll probably have um, tens of papers uh, in, uh, in t describing tumor genomes um, by this time next year. I would I would think. Um, so so this is kind of where the field is moving. Um, so right now we have uh, about a hundred thousand. Mutations uh, in cancer described in a database called Cosmic, which is uh, uh, just a, a repository of, of mutations that uh, is curated from the literature. Um, and these are the mo main point here is that these are mostly obtained through targeted studies. So investigators have a hunch that um, or have or have uh, legitimate reasons for chasing a certain gene and sequencing through a certain gene, and and lo and behold, they find mutations in that gene. Um, so these are kind of very directed targeted studies. But what next generation sequencing offers us is uh, now the ability to do mutation discovery in what I would call an unbiased way. So we can look at um, we can look at the whole whole genome now in a in a relatively cost effective way uh, to do mutation discovery, uh, where we don't really know ahead of time where the mutations might be or where they're hiding. Um, and so I think what we're we're going to move towards is um, this is a, a, a uh, uh, 1500s era map of the world, and uh, when when all the European explorers were trying to chart out try to chart out the globe, and it, you can see it's you know it's not quite accurate, it's kind of fuzzy, um, but but what we will move towards is a, a very 
hopefully a very much more precise um, landscape of, of mutations in, in cancer. And, um, and so this is really what biomarker discovery is all about. So the other reason for optimism is that um, new biology is being discovered. Um, so uh, here's an example uh, that was published in Nature just a couple of months ago um, about large non-coding RNAs in mammals. Uh, these are kind of new species of molecules that um, we didn't know really existed until just a few months ago. And so the question is, is um, almost, you know, almost, almost every new molecule has some variability in humans. And the question is, is what is um, the clinical, is, is there variability that is actually associated with, with, um, with clinical outcome or phenotypes? And uh, we just don't know. Uh, so, so th this is an area of, uh, of investigation that we want to measure these new biological markers in, uh, in, in human tissues and in, in, um, in, our, in our case control studies uh, that uh, may, may actually have some relevance to the clinic. Um, a classic example is um, uh, of recent, so microRNAs have only been really on the scene for a decade or so, uh, and all kinds of studies are coming out saying that um, you know, there are some associations and mutations in microRNAs, the differential expression of microRNAs um, have some clinical impact. Um, another, uh, another type of, um, of entity that are highly conserved non-coding elements. These are, these are elements that are highly conserved across mammals, but we just don't know what they do yet. And, um, and so uh, people are working furiously to try to, to understand what these do, but um, uh, we, we might see for example, if we in these cancer genomes, if we start to see mutations in these in these types of elements, uh, we might want to might want to try to try to associate that with um, with with, uh, with cancer. So so there are new molecules as, as well as um, higher dimensional uh, uh, and, and more precise measurements coming out. So and here's just uh, two examples of uh, a very large scale uh, high throughput projects that um, are really kind of uh, I think also hold a lot of optimism. Um, these are studies that are very ambitious and and are really kind of going past this small cohort uh, problem that I talked about uh, and really expanding cohort size uh, and, and doing um, standardized uh, data collection and data analysis. So. Um, so here's a, a paper from the, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas project um, uh, that Anna, Anna was actually involved in uh, uh, with Joe Gray's lab a little bit, part of this part of this organization, um, and uh, and so so they they published the, this paper just recently uh, on a comprehensive genomic characterizations of of, uh, of glioblastoma genes, and then another. Uh, organization that's come up, uh, it, it's been, in, it, its inception has been in the last uh, two, two years, two years now, Francis, uh, yeah, is the International Cancer Genome Consortium, and this is a group of investigators uh, in labs from around the world and involving uh, many, many countries. Uh, that. So, so these projects um, really uh, hold a lot of, of optimism because they um, are trying to look at large cohorts. Um, it's still 500 is 500 enough? Is 500 too much? It probably depends on the cancer type um, that you're looking at. Uh, uh, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, th this, these will be incredibly rich data sets um, that will need to be appropriately uh, mined and analyzed uh, in order to, to, to actually pull out uh, biomarkers uh, from this. So, so this is exactly where bioinformatics comes in. And, um, and a lot of you may not be kind of directly, uh, uh, you know, involved in, in developing methods for, for doing this, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, what, we, what we will have is, is large cohorts uh, and we'll have high dimensional data. And so what we will need to actually make sense from this is uh, a robust algorithmic and statistical tools uh, to bring knowledge from data. So, so Data generation is one thing, but ultimately, what we want is is, is knowledge from that data, and uh, and so uh, I think there's a, a lot of reason to be um, to be optimistic and a lot of reason to learn about bioinformatics um, given these types of, of projects um, that are that are ongoing. So uh, here's my hypocritical case report. Um, uh, so this is a study I was involved in uh, uh, at the BC Cancer Agency. And um, we actually profiled, uh, starting with 11 tumors, um, four of which were 
uh, granulosa cell tumors in the ovary. Um, and we discovered uh, a mutation that was present only in granulosa cell tumors um, and, and not in the other uh, subtypes of, uh, of ovarian cancer. Uh, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is actually what the, the mutation looks like. Um, and this is one of the examples where the signal was so strong that um, uh, it was kind of uh, it was hard to ignore. Um, and here's just uh, what this is called a sequence logo. And um, what it represents is the, the purity of, uh, of alignment um, where, whereby if you stack up um, sequence reads um, and you look at this position, all the positions would, all the reads would tell us that there's a G there um, and all the positions would tell us that there's an A there. And you can just move along. Let me just show, illustrate with this particular case. Um, so here you have a tiny bit of noise in the data. So we have a couple of, of T's here. Uh, but then you get to this position here, and we saw um, heterozygous mutations um, uh, encoding, uh, encoding a C to, to, a, to a G here. And, uh, and so then we looked uh, actually at what this, um, uh, the, the way we actually found this is essentially by uh, employing giant filters. So we look at all the coding positions. Uh, in, the, in the transcriptome. Um, then we look for all, all variants that actually um, uh, cause an amino acid change. And then we also ensure that none of these positions are already present in dbSNP. So we're really after somatic mutations that were specific to, to, to tumor subtypes. And if something actually was present in a database of, of known polymorphisms, the chances are likely that this is just a, a germline polymorphism that may be not related to cancer. So we had some very specific criteria for actually isolating these, um, uh, these events. And then the, the, the next thing we did is actually, uh, uh, so I mentioned that we sequenced four of these cases, and then we had uh, uh, tumors from other subtypes. And we required that a mutation be present um, only in one particular subtype um, and not in the others, so that it was, it was specific to the to subtype to, um, that would give us some clue that it was actually having something to do with the tumor biology of that subtype. So um, what we found is that we found this mutation in all four uh, index um, granulosa cell cases. Um, then we actually uh, took this further to a larger panel and uh, we collected uh, 89 granulosa cell tumors from around the world. These are actually quite rare tumors. So um, uh, the, the, the lead of this study, Dr. David Huntsman, um, he called in lots of favors from around the world, and, um, and people were sending us uh, additional samples. Uh, and we found this mutation at exactly the same position, again, in, 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 this, uh, in this gene, in 86 of 89 um, additional granulosa cell tumors. So we actually were able, because it's it was so specific and, and, um, and actually the same position, we were able to design an assay that just looked at that position um, in, in all the other cases that we got, um, that we received. So um, then we actually looked, uh, we used this assay and profiled 800 other types of cancers, including breast cancer and other ovarian cancers and lung cancer, and it wasn't present there. Um, so. This, this is a, a disease, and maybe you know some of the pathologists can, can comment on this. Maybe Blaze probably knows it the best, but uh, maybe you can just talk about what, uh, what the, the histology and the diagnosis of this. Okay. Yeah, histology is uh, it's, uh, quantitative type of So, so Blaze, that was a collaborator on this study as well, so he helped us, helped us a great deal. So, um, so this provides now kind of a very, yes, please. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, yes, so, so that's an important, yeah, thank you for that. So, so one thing we needed to do up front is actually determine that this was a somatic mutation, so it's only in the, in the tumor cells and not in the normal. So we had normal DNA for these cases as well, and we looked at the normal, and we looked at the tumor uh, to make sure that it's only present in the tumor and not in the normal. So, 
So if it was a germline mutation, something that you're born with, then it would be present in both. Okay. Even if you put the other like on, you can say that after B that those three that you have the mutation are actually not the one that's what we we th we can explain away those three actually. Uh, so so there there's some ambiguity around two of them, and one of them is actually really quite diffuse. The sample was uh, probably did, the signal just wasn't strong enough in the sample itself. So um, so we we couldn't really report that. I mean that's kind of cheating retrospectively, but uh, but in truth, actually we could explain away those three. Yeah. Um, and so. What this finding does provide is now a, a diagnostic and, uh, and and a target for novel, uh, for potentially a novel therapeutic. It just so happens that this is a transcription factor, um, and these are notoriously difficult to target from from the therapy perspective. Um, so, but um, but nonetheless, uh, we've actually identified what we think is the is the important um, driver mutation in this disease. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think there are two two important things that need to happen here. Is uh, from from this point on is one one is actually it's not functionally characterized yet. We don't really know from the lector standpoint what this mutation is actually doing, and so there's a number of follow up research that's going on right now to, to actually try to characterize that and we have potentially have created a model system um, using cell lines uh, but uh, it's still it's still ongoing um, but uh, nonetheless um, so that's that's one thing that needs to happen and and the second thing as you write is is that um, I think it needs to be expanded you know much into into actually prospective trials and and uh, to see if uh, it actually helps in larger cohorts. The problem is that assembling a large cohort of these patients is difficult because it's a rare tumor. So, um, so okay. So I just wanted to actually draw your attention to this part. Um, this is this is a nice paper that talks about uh, um, uh, proteomics-based um, biomarker discovery. But what it does is it illustrates um, really quite nicely, I think, um, the, the, the kind of process of biomarker discovery here. And the, the important things to note is that um, when we start out in these, in these studies, um, we look at many, many, many markers. So we look at thousands of genes. We look at 3 billion nucleotides. Um, we look at uh, uh, you know, tens of immunohistochemical markers, um, uh, you name it. Um, and, and we usually do this in a small number of samples, because usually these types of profiling experiments are quite expensive. Um, then as we uh, find associations in this, in, in, in the small cohort, um, we need to go through a process, of a series of steps whereby we grow the cohort, uh, but hopefully also reduce the number of markers that we're looking at, uh, until at the very end we're dealing with a small number of markers and a large number of patients. So um, from, a, from a sort of experimental design and discovery point of view, uh, I think this is the paradigm that, uh, that needs to be followed. And in fact, it's actually what, you know, in a, in a kind of uh, uh, probably a coarser way than this, um, is what we did in, in our study, uh, where, whereby um, we really did profile the whole transcriptome and looked at 60 million um, coding positions um, in, in a small number of cases, and then, uh, well, we zeroed it down to one uh, and in a larger number of cases. But it, it, that, that's, um, I think, really uh, uh, an important aspect of, of the process of biomarker discovery. The, the main issue is that one needs to validate and revalidate and revalidate using um, larger and larger cohorts in order to make uh, sense of our discoveries. Uh, and this is a quote from, uh, from, from David Huntsman, actually, um, that I'm stealing here. Uh, and he says that um, an ideal genomic study becomes genetic. So, um, so we start by looking at the whole thing, and we narrow it down to very few. OK, so then just uh, in, in, to recap, then, uh, we've gone over, hopefully, what a biomarker is. Um, We've learned that uh, few biomarkers are currently in use in cancer. Uh, we have some reason for optimism that um, new technologies are actually uh, providing uh, results. So, so you know, we've added one mutation to that um, 100,000 in, in cosmic, 
Um, but uh, one can imagine that as, as, as these projects like the ICGC and the TCGA um, ramp up, and even it doesn't need to be huge studies like that. I mean, they're, they're um, probably very directed studies in, in various labs that are going on here, um, that new technologies are, are showing promising results. And we've gone over the, the process of, of biomarker discovery. So, um, so that sort of concludes the, the, this part of the, uh, the, the lecture, but I, I do want to ask if there are any uh, questions or comments, and maybe we can have a little discussion for the, for the remaining 10 minutes before we go on, on a break. So are there any, any comments or questions on, um, on what we've seen so far? Um, so that, that's the big that's the big million dollar question is what is, what is all this data actually going to get us? Um, is personalized medicine, which is a, you know this this buzzword that's been around for I don't know half a decade now, maybe longer, um, it, are we going to realize that? Is that something that we're actually going to be able to to get to? Um, the days are still very early for that, I think. Um, uh, but uh, but maybe we'll take slow steps towards that, and I and I hope that um, you know Dr. Shearer will, will give us a perspective on that um, at, at the end of tomorrow uh, as well. So, um, but if there are any any other comments on, on that particular issue, um, maybe some of the clinicians can comment on that. Please. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next in the next set. Uh, if you want to know the new classification, it's going to be perform better than the older one. And that's that's our goal, right? Well, but yeah. And theoretically, yes, because it's more and more objective. Now it has to be proven that uh, that's going to be the good that we're sustaining. Yeah, I mean, I, I come from the somewhat narrow perspective of, of just ovarian cancer as well, and and, uh, and so David uh, and others and his colleagues I mean, have basically um, redefined uh, what ovarian cancer is. It's not one disease; it's it's multiple different diseases, and it needs to be considered as such. And that's done through through markers. Yeah. Any other comments? Anna, do you have uh, anything to add or to say? No? Okay. Okay, great. Well, I think in that case, then we'll, we'll, we'll break and uh, we'll come back here at 10.50 uh, and uh, we will uh, hear from Anna about alternative splicing in clinical genomics. So, the coffee's just outside. And... Okay, so we have uh, quite a few things to cover before lunch. So, I think we'll get started. Uh, so, We've gone over now what a biomarker is and, um, and some definitions for a biomarker. Now we're, just, we're going to talk about measurement technologies uh, that are in current use in, in genomics and proteomics. So, and we're going to cover uh, gene expression microarrays. Uh, and these are really cursory overviews, but it's just to make you aware that these are technologies that are being used. So gene expression microarrays, um, genomic microarrays for uh, SNP and copy number uh, detection. We're going to talk about next generation sequencing. We'll talk a little bit about immunohistochemistry as well. So gene expression microarrays. Um, well, the biology of this is is actually to uh, to quantitate transcripts, so mRNA uh, transcripts, and um, the the technology that's used is uh, is hybridization and fluorescence intensity. Um, so many people in this room um, understand that. Quite well, and uh, so it's not necessarily to go into details about that. Um, so one of the limitations is that um, of this technology is that essentially what we're probing for is things we already know about. So uh, we have some idea of, of the annotations of the genes in the human genome, and we're going to probe those um, for, uh, for 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 transcript quantitation. So um, so there. Are, Basically, the limitation is that um, we can't find things, we can't discover new transcripts, for example, using microarrays. Um, so here are some of the biological questions that one would ask of, uh, uh, of a microarray experiment, and, and feel free to, to jump in with other ones. So, uh, for example, so which genes are differentially expressed in my samples versus control, or my one subtype versus the other subtype? Um, what subgroups can be identified in my population based on their gene expression profiling? So um, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of papers with, um, with, with clustering of gene expression. Um, and then finally, you know, can a gene expression signature actually be used to classify a new sample? So if I have a gene expression signature that's associated with a certain 
um, class of, of a phenotypic class, um, and I have a new case that comes in, and I don't know what phenotypic class it belongs to. Can I just use the gene expression uh, to, to classify my sample? So, so here's just an example of the data. So essentially what we get out after, and this is really after uh, many steps of normalization, and, uh, and so uh, that needs to be done correctly, um, uh, and, and is a field unto itself. But we get a data matrix, um, and we have n rows, okay, uh, and, and p columns here. And, uh, and n is often much, much larger than p, and we've talked about that already. Uh, and so this matrix X, um, the, the, the actual entries in the matrix, um, represents a well, relative quantity uh, for transcript I uh, for sample J. Okay. Um, and so the types of analysis that we do, um, uh, we, we do normalization. This is a critical first step in gene expression analysis, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, uh, we want to look at differential expression. We can do what, is called, what we call unsupervised clustering, and I'll talk about that this afternoon, what that is. Uh, we can do classification. Um, we can do longitudinal studies. So um, it, uh, often in model organisms, we want to take measurements at different time points and see which, which genes get turned on at what, what time points. Um, and then uh, uh, a number of you participated in the workshop um, uh, just, just last week, um, and we can do things like network reconstruction. So we try to find genes that are co-expressed and um, that actually belong to the, to the same type of biological network. So uh, there's tons of software for gene expression. Um, uh, a place to go looking is, is really uh, an amazing resource uh, is called Bioconductor. Uh, and these are a set of modules and, um, and libraries that are written in, in, in the R statistical language. Um, this, uh, this set of software contains 320 software packages um, that are uh, more than half, I think, are devoted to microarray analysis, uh, gene expression analysis. Um, there are 400 annotation packages, and there are books and tutorials available um, uh, on all this. You just go to bioconductor.org, and, and, um, and that'll point you to all the, the, the resources. Uh, just another example piece of software is called Gene Pattern. Um, this is from the Broad Institute, and this is much more of a sort of a point-click type of um, type of package that you can install. It's freely available, um, and, and it will have uh, many of the types of um, analyses that I've mentioned um, uh, to you. So uh, another type of uh, way in which we measure um, these biomarkers is, is high-density genotyping arrays. So now we're talking about DNA, and so the bi biology is looking for. Um, one is for single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, and the other is uh, DNA copy number changes. So um, there are arrays that are, uh, can do genotyping for, for one million SNPs. Um, does anybody not know what a SNP is? Does anyone know? Yeah. Everyone knows what a SNP is? OK. All right, good. So if there's anything that I say that you don't know what it is, just put your hand up, because I'm assuming you know most people are, are in genetics or in biology. So. Um, uh, so uh, the, the other thing that these, these arrays now give us um, is uh, we can actually measure allele-specific copy number changes. So um, in cancer, sometimes um, uh, one allele is prefer preferentially amplified or deleted, and, and it might be of use to know which allele. Um, uh, these are uh, DNA copy number changes are a major source of human variation, and, and actually Dr. Shearer, who's going to give us our talk tomorrow, uh, played a major role in, in discovering that um, structural variants in DNA um, actually are, are uh, a major source of human variation. Um, and then uh, there are congenital, so most of the, the, the copy number changes that we'll talk about in the context of this workshop are somatic alterations in tumor genomes, um, but um, there are congenital abnormalities um, whereby uh, people are born with these um, um, uh, alterations in their genomes, um, and, and that has implications for mental retardation and autism. Uh, and and then, uh, again, I mentioned somatic alteration in cancer. These are, so this is the type of um, biology that can be measured with high-density genotyping arrays. Um, here's just an example of a data set um, and, and some example questions. So, so which regions in the genome are recurrently altered in my cohort? So here I've just plotted the genome. Um, and th these are the chromosomes 1, 2, 3, all the way to, this should be X here, um, so it's labeled 1, but just this is 1 through X. And, uh, and then so one can actually measure the frequency of alterations. So this is a heat map representation of copy number changes 
The red indicates amplification, so extra copies of DNA. The green in, uh, indicates loss. And, uh, and, and so you can summarize across this, this, this patient core, each row represents a patient. Um, and you can see that, well, you know, the, this chromosome arm uh, one 1Q one uh, is, is, is recurrently amplified in, in, almost, uh, in almost 40 to 50 percent of the cases. Um, uh, this, is, this is a breast cancer data set, by the way. Um, and we have uh, 8Q as well is, uh, is amplified. And these are, um, these are sort of known patterns that, that occur. And, and actually what we're going to do in the lab is, is actually do something just, just like this. Okay, so we're going we're to process uh, array CGH data. Uh, we're going to find out where the copy number changes are. And then we're going to try to look at um, the frequency of alteration in different subgroups um, of cancer. And we're going to do this in the lab. So, uh, so the, the logical question is then, you know, can the cohort, um, not only do we want to look at fre frequency across the whole population, but we want to look at um, if there are subgroups that can be discovered from the data. So that, that's an example. And again, we're going to do that in the lab as well. So, um, so here is uh, a rate, an example of um, what the data looks like for array CGH. So uh, here is a, just chromosome 1. And uh, this is just an example from a mantle cell lymphoma cell line. And, uh, and on the x-axis is the physical location along the chromosome. And on the y-axis is the relative, um, uh, relative uh, hybridization intensity of, uh, uh, of the DNA in a tumor sample versus a normal sample. And so basically what that means is that negative, and this is a log 2 ratio, so negative numbers mean that there's probably a deletion. Um, of, of that region of the chromosome, and positive numbers mean that there's probably an amplification uh, in the chromosome. Um, sorry, it's pretty hard to see this slide, but um, over here I've, sh I've shown that uh, with, with SNP genotyping, actually what you get uh, in addition to copy number change, so here there's a little copy number change here, um, but uh, so we can actually see uh, alleles, the allele specific hybridization intensity because both um, both versions of the SNP are actually hybridized on, on these arrays, and you can see that there's a differential um, uh, there's a differential copy number change in, in the allele specific um, sense. So uh, the analysis for uh, high density genotyping arrays. Um, so uh, there, there's uh, normalization usually uh, entails um, for the SNP arrays. Um, sometimes if you pro you're probing two alleles, and um, most of the, the probe sequence is actually identical except for one, one position. And so sometimes what you get is what's called allelic crosstalk. So you get the wrong allele hybridizing. And so you can actually try to correct for that. Um, uh, the, the DNA fragment length and also the GC content of the um, of, the, of the, uh, the probes actually make quite a difference in in, in, in the actual uh, signal that one gets from from these arrays. So uh, it's important to uh, to do this step. And uh, again, um, I'll point to some software that can do this uh, for for uh, for genotyping arrays. Um, the next step is actually to do what's called segmentation. Um, uh, so what that means is actually you want to find the, the breakpoints. So here one would, one would assume that actually uh, 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 there's actually a biological event here that um, encompasses this deletion and one wants to actually determine uh, exactly where those breakpoints are. And so you can look within those breakpoints for what genes might be in there, for example. So if there's a tumor suppressor gene in this deletion, um, then, it, it, then one has uh, a, a pretty high confidence that um, maybe that's a targeted deletion by this cancer and, and, uh, uh, and, and that should be followed up. Um, so in addition to actually determining breakpoints, one, one wants to also classify these segments as being, um, for example, unchanged, deleted, or gained. Um, and, and so there's models that, for example, uh, called state space models, that actually find breakpoints and classify the segments as well. So you end up with this kind of, um, this as input, which is just um, kind of a group of noisy um, black dots. And one wants to actually classify um, biologically what these black dots actually mean. Okay, so that's what, that's what I've done here. So uh, here's just some, uh, a few tools for, uh, for high density genotyping arrays. Um, again, Bioconductor, many, many packages. Uh, uh, there's my own set of software uh, called CNA Hammer, um, and um, I'm actually 
Unfortunately, I haven't quite finished this yet, so, uh, but I am compiling a whole list of references and resources that I'll put on the wiki for module one, so you can refer back to that, uh, and I'll post basically all the, the links to software and, and all the references that I've um, talked about in this, uh, in this module so far. So uh, for SNP arrays, um, normalization, for example, for Affymetrics, uh, SNP6, there's a package in, uh, in R called aroma.affymetrics. Um, and this does all those uh, Alila crosstalk, um, GC content normalization, et cetera. Um, and then uh, some other uh, Alila specific copy number um, uh, type of algorithms, um, one called Quanti SNP, the other Penn CMB. Um, one wants to be able to genotype, and so there are a number of algorithms for that um, C realm, B realm, and bird seed. And again, I'll point you to these references. For uh, visualization, um, there's the uh, integrated genomics viewer from the Broad Institute and, uh, and a Sigma 2 package from, uh, from the BCCRC in Vancouver. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about immunohistochemical staining. Um, so the biology here that we're measuring is are actually protein levels. Um, and also um, localization of proteins. So the technology is based on um, having a labeled antibody uh, binding to an antigen. And this, is, uh, uh, this can be done in, in relatively high numbers of cases on, on what we call tissue microarrays. Um, and then the limitation of this is that um, you actually have to have an antibody available for the protein that you want to uh, quantify. So um, some example questions. Uh, is my protein of interest expressed in my sample? Um, which part of the cell does my protein of interest actually localize to? Is it to the membrane? Is it, is it to the nucleus? Um, how abundantly expresses my protein? And, um, and then uh, immunohistochemistry, and again, probably others in the room can comment on this uh, a bit more than I can, is, uh, 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 it can be used in diagnosis, so we can um, uh, get a better feel for, for subtypes of cancer um, uh, prognosis and, and can, can actually be predictive as well. So here's what the data look like. Um, so this is an immunohistochemical stain of uh, a gene called beta-catenin. And when there's a mutation in beta-catenin in ovarian cancer, um, the, uh, the, the, the protein actually localizes to the nucleus. So um, hopefully what you can see there, and maybe it's difficult to see, but um, uh, are, are there kind of um, concentrated brown blobs here uh, in, this, in, the, in these slides? Um, and uh, and what that indicates is that this protein has actually localized uh, to the nucleus. And in a, in a case that um, does not have the mutation, the staining is actually restricted to the, to the, mem to the membrane of the cell. And so this is used as a diagnostic um, for, for a particular subtype of ovarian cancer. Um, just a comment about this technology is that it's fairly low throughput. Um, but uh, it's highly specific, so um, so you you know you can't have your cake and eat it too, so it's um, it works very well, um, but uh, uh, it, it's relatively low throughput. Analysis software. An analysis, yeah, image. image analysis software, yeah. So so that um, I think uh, is not really well employed. Um, usually you have human beings looking at these slides um, that uh, have expertise and um, can can re readily tell. Um, the, the outcomes of these, of these stains. So uh, here's just a, an example of use of immunohistochemical markers to, um, to subtype ovarian cancer. And this is a paper written by my colleague, Martin Kobel. Um, and uh, so uh, basically, these are the immunohistochemical markers here. Um, these are the subtypes of ovarian cancer. And you can see that they're really kind of wildly different um, expression levels. So the, 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 the z-axis here in this three-dimensional plot is the level of, um, of expression of these, these particular proteins. And, uh, and so um, it's, really, it's really quite striking that these have quite different um, profiles in terms of uh, protein expression of these markers. And whereas you know, in the past, um, and actually even in the present, um, ovarian cancer is really treated as one disease. Um, it's it's uh, it's pretty clear that they have very different uh, histological features and, and should be considered as a different disease. So this is just an application of immunohistochemistry uh, into actually clinical uh, um, uh, interpretation of, of ovarian cancer. So let's move now on to uh, next generation sequencing. So the biology involved here 
uh, is uh, <laughs> almost everything. So uh, these assays can get you so many different features uh, of a genome, so including signal nucleotide variants. So we're getting down to the resolution of the nucleotides where we can detect point mutations and insertions and deletions. Um, using paired end sequencing, we can detect genome rearrangements. Um, we can detect copy number changes similar to uh, array CGH and SNP arrays, but at much more uh, exquisite resolution. Um, uh, uh, we can detect uh, sequence inversions um, in RNA-seq uh, libraries, which uh, is just the sequencing of the, the uh, mRNA. We can detect transcript expression. Um, and again, I already mentioned insertions and deletions, um, which are uh, of um, relatively small length, but um, can be readily detected with this technology. So um, a colleague of mine and I uh, are engaged in a project in sequencing Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, just using short reads, um, uh, we sequence the Hodgkin's cell, lymphoma cell line. Um, using 50 base pair reads, we're actually able to detect in insertions and deletions of size uh, 11 and 15 um, down to uh, right, the, the actual um, exact nucleotide that's reported in the literature based on the cell line. So um, the, the, the resolution of these technologies is, is exquisite. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the potential challenge um, is that it produces uh, uh, mi literally millions and millions of data points per case. Um, and uh, uh, I was recently involved in a, in a project for which we sequenced uh, uh, a breast cancer genome. And we literally produced 120 billion data points uh, for one case. So it's a lot of data. So uh, here's some example questions. So what does an individual tumor, person, animal um, actually look like at nucleotide resolution? Um, this is a view that we're getting of these tumors and these organisms um, that uh, we weren't able to do before. So I actually liken this to uh, Van Leeuwenhoek looking down the microscope for the first time and seeing that there are bugs on the slide, you know, that there are bacteria down there. And, and I think we're really in this kind of age of, of, of discovery where um, uh, we're seeing things that we've never been able to see before. So it's really quite, quite exciting. Uh, what is the genome architecture of my sample? Um, what single nucleotide variants exist in my sample? Uh, what transcripts are expressed and at what quantity? What are the recurrent aberrations in my set of samples? And uh, what pathways are potentially dysregulated by mutations? And, and so these are the, this latter question, again, is something that um, you, know, you may have visited uh, last week in, uh, in Gary's workshop. So this technology uh, gives you um, in one assay, uh, what you'd have to do, um, you know, multiple, multiple, uh, using various different technologies, and uh, and so that's why it has great appeal. It's still quite expensive to sequence through a tumor genome. Um, sequencing the, the transcriptome um, or, or using RNA seq is much more efficient because you're just looking at the express sequence. Um, but uh, but nonetheless, I think this is the this is certainly the way of the future and, and possibly you know quite possibly the way of the present. So just um, a, a brief overview of, um, of what the process here is. And this is just a schematic cartoon. So when the data comes off the sequencer, we get these unaligned reads. And here I've shown um, paired end reads. So these little blue bars represent a read. And that, this can be, for example, 50 to 75 nucleotides long. And um, they're, they're paired in the sense that um, they're separated by, uh, by what we call an insert sequence that we don't actually sequence, but we have a general idea of how far away this is because the fragments are size selected. Uh, and then, so we sequence how, how, big are uh, how big are the inserts? Usually about 200 nucleotides. So, so, so we, t we size select for about 250 to 300, yeah. Um, and then, so we take these uh, paradigm alignments and, uh, sorry, we take the paradigm reads and we actually align them to the genome. So. The really important part about this is that you can't do this without the human genome reference in the first place, um, because um, it, the, the Human Genome Project um, invested a huge amount of algorithmic time and computational time in assembling longer fragments. And that was a major part of the Human Genome Project, was actually to try to assemble it. Um, you can't do assembly with short fragments, so you have to have a, a, a genome that's already there uh, in order to align the fragments to. Okay, so then once we have aligned reads, um, 
then uh, we can do some inference on the on the variants that are in these uh, in this data, and so we can, for example, predict um, single nucleotide variants. Um, and then once we do that, certainly in tumor biology, we need to um, we need to do some validation. So we want to confirm um, whether it's somatic. And again, what's required here is that a sample should be chosen very carefully, so that if you have based on whether you have matched normal DNA to actually validate um, the mutations that you find. So if you find a, a variant in the tumor, you want to be able to see if it's also present in the germline or blood uh, DNA from the blood. Um, so we can confirm some that are somatic, confirm some that are germline. Um, due to the, the noise and the short reads and the misalignment that happens, um, we get false positives. And so um, when you get predictions out of this data, uh, one ha has to validate it using other techniques like capillary based sequencing or other, other based sequencing in order to actually um, confirm that it's true. Um, so validation is critically important. Uh, and, then, and then, like I said, what we did in a FOXL2 uh, case is uh, in granulosis cell tumors is, is actually take, take then um, a handful of the, uh, of the variants and, and um, characterize them um, for recurrence and, and functional significance in larger cohorts. So here's just what the data actually looks like. <clears throat> so here uh, I've just shown uh, the actual sequence reads um, actually as they would be aligned to the genome, for example. Okay, so, uh, so and then just cutting it off um, at, at a certain position. So, so here you have uh, the reads like this, okay, and then where the dashed lines just indicates that's the end of the sequence. Um, uh, and so there's, these are just piled up on top of each other. And then what, what one can do is actually um, represent this alignment in a set of what I call allelic counts. So here you have a vector um, that just shows how many times you, you, um, you have a read that matches the reference sequence. Okay. So again, this is a, this is, um, a reference sequence that's, that's the human genome, HG18 or NCBI36, or, uh, 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 that you can download from, um, from, from UCSC or, or Ensemble or your favorite genome browser. Um, and then, so then you can literally just do a counting exercise. So how many, how many reads um, uh, uh, actually match my reference? So here you have three reads that match the reference and you have zero that don't match the reference. Um, and then so here's one that maybe looks like a variant. So here you have um, six reads that I've highlighted with the C's. Um, that don't match the reference, and you have only one that matches the reference. Okay, so uh, so so here you potentially have a variant, and then here's another type of variant here. Um, and and so um, the, you know I've done a lot of work, and, and some of my colleagues have done a lot of work in actually modeling these data. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's a very good question. So uh, so theoretically, um, in order to see uh, let's say for a heterozygous position, um, in order to see two alleles, uh, uh, so two reads um, that represent each allele, uh, so by what's called the binomial distribution, theoretical calculation, one would need to um, uh, have a depth of 11 uh, in order to see two alleles 99% of the time. Okay, now then by a, what's called a Poisson distribution um, in terms of coverage, in order to get uh, at least 11 at 99% of the um, positions in the genome, one would have to sequence to about 27-fold um, coverage of the genome. Um, so that, that's kind of the theoretical argument for a normal genome. Everything goes haywire when you're dealing with tumor genomes because you get copy number alterations and, um, and you're dealing with sample heterogeneity as well. So sometimes you get different clonal populations of cells. Um, you have normal cells mixed in as well, and so your signal gets diluted. Yeah. Yeah, so the focus regions are going to be for the cancer genome, they're doing 40 or 40 people. Right. They're going 40 yet. So, so what we did for uh, this breast cancer case that I mentioned a little while ago is we went to 43x, um, which, so in our initial calculations, it's, it's expensive and, and actually um, what we showed in our, our study is that um, if you sequence the transcriptome uh, as well, uh, you can actually do moderate genome coverage 
and uh, and and combined with the transcriptome, we actually cover it cover most of the exons um, that are expressed uh, adequately enough. So um, the genome is incredibly expensive to sequence, but as I mentioned, the transcriptome is much more efficient. Um, so so you can get away with um, hundreds of millions of reads, or have been billions of reads uh, with the transcriptome. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example. Correct. Yeah. For example. So, so it's still an expensive proposition. Uh, I think to see, it's reasonable to say that um, given today's throughput, to sequence a genome to 40x coverage is still over $100,000. Okay, so um, it's an incredible amount of uh, activity and software development and, and analytical tools uh, has sprung up as a result of next-gen sequencing. Um, here's just a, a list of, uh, uh, of tools um, for alignment. Uh, for detecting single nucleotide variants, for insertions and deletions, um, copy number changes, expression, um, and, and it, of course there's a workshop um, devoted to this uh, that if some of you are already registered, then you're good to go. If not, then you can register for next year, um, uh, led by Francis uh, and colleagues. Okay, so just a point about validation. So. Um, high throughput measurement technologies are noisy. Uh, we know that. Um, so predictions must be validated using lower throughput but more accurate experimental assays. Okay? So that's just a statement that is true and um, you need to do it. <laughs> okay, so here's an example. Um, so in this breast cancer genome that I keep referring to, uh, uh, what we have, um, we found uh, an amplification of, um, of the insulin receptor amplicon by, uh, by doing copy number analysis. And um, I hope you can see that, maybe you can't, but this is a fluorescence in situ hybridization. Um, at the back, you know what this is, um, uh, validation of, of this amplicon. And you can see that there, there are many more red dots here than green dots. So the red dots are the insulin receptor amplicon. And, uh, insulin receptor probe and the green dots are control. Uh, and, and, and then actually this is in the metastatic tumor. And we also found this amplicon in the, in the primary tumor. So this was selected for the evolution of this tumor. Um, then uh, uh, here's, a, here's an example of a very high level ampl amplification of the MAP2K3 locus. Again, this is validated using uh, FISH. Uh, this is a case that was not present in the primary tumor. So this was kind of a, what we call a progression event. Uh, so this is just give you a, a kind of a pictorial example that um, you can make predictions. Um, th these two happen to be true uh, in in the in the single nucleotide variants that we found in this tumor. Um, about 30 percent of them turned out to be false, so they turned out to be not reproducible by other um, by other assays. So um, in high throughput measurement technology, one needs to validate. So let's just go over then. Um, we, we've talked about what gene expression is. We talked about what DNA copy number uh, and the allelic variation is. We talked about protein quantitation, and we talked about next generation sequencing. And um, and so the lab this afternoon focuses on uh, gene expression and copy number. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to link that to, to clinical data. Um, so just the last couple of points is that the measurement technologies are getting denser. This means more data, and again, validation is critical to make uh, conclusions from, from these assets. Okay. So any questions on this material? Yeah. Regarding the next generation sequence, is there any way that we can look at the portion of the genome? Yeah. So, so, so people are working on that. Um, uh, people call it exome sequencing or exon capture techniques, whereby you hybridize, um, you probe for exons, for example, and then you can extract the DNA from those hybridizations and just make a library out of that and sequence that. Um, so my understanding is that, that that's still still under technology development. It's it's, it's starting to work, but um, it's not. You, you, you don't have um, the, the quantities of DNA needed are very high, for one. Um, so that's actually a severe limitation. Um, and and it's 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 mature, still technology that's maturing, but um, Francis might have a perspective to offer on that. But uh, I think uh, the
what they have done very decently. If any individual is concerned, it's their yeah. And so that it's sort of it's halfway between mm -hmm. it's not it's targeted to you, so you're 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 against it, which is tender because you know already you're receiving a, a management, mm -hmm. but you're doing these sneaky little things and it's very hard for you because you don't know exactly where to be. You look at all the follow more yeah. So another uh, another example of that is that um, so th this tumor we had a matched uh, primary tumor um, that, that we looked at, and so we took all the variants that we discovered and validated in the metastatic tumor, um, design um, PCR primers um, across those those variants, um, amplified those up, and put those back on the Illumina machine um, using the prime. We made a, a library out of the primary tumor. So we discovered the variants in the metastatic. And then we sequence very deeply in the primary tumor to see um, at what frequency or what portion of cells already contain those mutations. Um, and so you can get up to 10,000, 100,000 fold redundancy um, sequencing in, in, that, in that targeted way. Uh, does that make sense to you? Yeah. So, um, so, so actually we were able to um, characterize uh, the evolution of the tumor uh, in terms of these somatic variants um, by looking at um, Mutations that just weren't present at all, even in 100,000 copies. Some that were present between one and two percent of cells, and then the rest that were above that threshold as well. Um, so, yeah. Could you, could one use a normal microarray recognition technique in which you just put your target there and see yeah. the genome from cancer, then count them to see the number of sequences that are normal and abnormal, and then? So I think um, what you what converting the, the color sign into a number into sequencing. Uh, I think what people are doing for for that purpose, what you're talking about, is is actually doing barcoding. So you can attach yeah. a barcode um, that uh, identifies the sample, um, and and so when you sequence it, then you can pull out the reads that have that barcode as uh, as get, belonging to one sample and separate them out that way. Uh, and so that, that technology is actually um, just coming online now, the barcoding and multiplexing technique. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we're um, ready for the switch gears now. And I'll invite uh, Anna to come up and uh, talk about alternative splicing. Okay, so... Um um, as, um, as I mentioned before, I've uh, recently, for the last few years, I've been uh, uh, focusing on the research of splicing aberrations in cancer. Um, and uh, when we started this program um, in 2004, back at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, nobody really knew um, what the uh, situation with uh, splicing overall in the, in the, on the global scale in cancer and how to measure it and how to interpret the results that um, come out from the microarray experiments measuring um, the levels of splice isoforms. Nor there was a, um, a certain understanding of what is the value of this knowledge for uh, cancer research in general and clinical applications in particular. And so over uh, back then, we started a collaboration with uh, Appmetrics, and we tried to use the uh, research platform, um, the uh, Human uh, Axon Array. Um, and uh, we've done um, quite a lot of uh, uh, research using that platform. We, we've uh, made a great progress, uh, um, having gone through a lot of obstacles over those years. And so, Right now, um, we pretty much know, and there's been a, um, a number of, a uh, great number of different publications devoted to the microarray analysis um, of splicing in cancer, particularly with um, uh, introduction of some new statistical methods and so on and so forth. But uh, so it is pretty much clear right now how to do this uh, thing for cancer in particular. And, um, how to measure um, the global profiles of splicing. But at the same time, this splicing uh, is still very much underappreciated. Um, and um, um, so there is, 
it's 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 pretty much neglected, specific, uh, especially within the uh, clinical application field. Uh, and um, I think um, that the, the first slide that Zora showed you with the um, uh, examples of different biomarkers actually speaks to itself, right? There was no mentioning of uh, uh, biomarkers uh, <laughs> that came from splicing isoforms. So, and that's that's actually the general trend. So, for some reason, splicing is still uh, perceived as such a um, weird uh, thing that is basically can be neglected, uh, whereas it is really very important layer of information and layer of opportunity for a um, discovery of novel biomarkers. And there's been a precedent of using splice isoforms for clinical applications. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, the ratio of um, a certain enzyme splice isoforms is used to predict the uh, treatment outcome of this disease. Uh, there are other examples where uh, the antibodies against the alternative region in the uh, protein isoforms have been used for um, improving uh, diagnosis, and that happened in, the, in human glioblastomas. And then, um, so uh, there is um, another example, for, uh, for instance, how we can manipulate uh, splicing and control uh, behavior of cells, and that precedent took place in um, one study that was published for pancreatic cancer, where they tried to manipulate the level of um, expression of one of the regulators of splicing, and they were uh, showing that um, the cellular phenotype had changed and basically reversed to more normal phenotype. So there is um, an endless number of, of opportunities here within this splicing, and um, I think I now I've become a preacher of this, uh, and I'm trying to bring this layer of information into the clinical and cancer research. So, and within the following some 20 minutes, I'm going to convince you that this is really something to uh, go for. Um, uh, this slide is just to tell you that, indeed, the majority, if not all, of the human genes undergo alternative splicing uh, in time and uh, condition-dependent manner. And uh, some recent um, uh, deep sequencing studies have shown that it's probably about 98% of all the human genes undergo splicing. And, of course, this is very tightly uh, regulated process with uh, many factors uh, involved. And so, of course, this is a excellent target for uh, disruption. And so, uh, alternative splicing indeed has been shown to be implicated in many human diseases, including cancer. So, this slide just shows you how complex the process of splicing of pre-mRNA. Um, so, it is uh, undertaken by a huge, um, protein complex comprised of some 200 proteins. Um, and so you can imagine that th there are um, different axons in the gene, and some of them are constitutive axons, which are included into all of the transcript isoforms of that gene. And there are alternative axons that are included or excluded or spliced in some, um, uh, some other different way uh, in a particular tissue or state of the development. Um, and so those alternative axons, uh, and this is a very simple case of a cassette axon when you have just a one axon which is either included or excluded. And so um, for this very simple situation, you see that um, there are flanking regions of splice sites um, around this alternative axon and um, some other signals, regulatory signals, uh, which is this polypyrimidin track and this branching point. And these are all the regulatory sites, which are called cis regulators. And basically, um, the components of a spliceosome, that's, uh, that's what it's called, are trans regulators. And these are both uh, RNAs and um, proteins, which regulate uh, splicing and um, do it in a very precise manner. So uh, these sites are actually um, uh, spread throughout the genome, and there is a number of cryptic splice sites. And it is very important to recognize a true splice site. 
uh, but not cryptic ones. And so that's what the uh, splices home machinery does here. So, and you can see certainly that all, um, uh, all aspects of this uh, splices home machinery uh, uh, can be targeted with mutations or uh, some other uh, types of aberrations and can be disrupted. And that's what happens in cancer in particular. So you may have a, a mutations in cis um, uh, regulators in those regulatory sequences, or you can um, alter the uh, components of a splicing machinery, such as knock out one of the um, uh, splicing regulatory proteins. And this results in aberrations of splicing. It can have a massive effect. For example, uh, if you um, change the level of one of the splice factors, which target many genes, you may have a really chain reaction uh, and change in splicing of many, many downstream genes. And so, uh, of course, this leads to the situation when you uh, deregulate many cellular processes, which uh, lead to these uh, different outcomes, which are characteristic to cancer. So um, there has been a, a growing body of evidence in the literature that uh, many cancer genes um, actually have a cancer-specific isoforms. Um, so you, you can find uh, very simple cases such as a single cassette axon where you have a production of two isoforms excluding and including alternative isoform, uh, alternative axon. And these are just a few examples of um, such events taking place in, in cancer cells. For the FGFR1, for instance, um, there is one axon um, which is um, uh, excluded in cancer, and it's correlated with poor prognosis. Uh, so for the WISP1 gene, uh, there is a cancer-specific short isoform excluding the alternative axon, uh, which has a different uh, biological properties. Um, then you can see that um, there may be a situation where in cancer you have a uh, inclusion of alternative axon, and that happens um, in the uh, classical example of this in BCLX gene when uh, where there are two isoforms, uh, short isoform is normal and it's pro apoptotic and the long uh, isoform, including alternative axon, is anti apoptotic and it correlates with uh, resistance to chemotherapy. Uh, there is a whole number of different types uh, of splicing events. Uh, this is probably the simplest and this is probably the most complex where there is a tandem of alternative axons someplace uh, in the middle of the gene, and these axons can be spliced even in different combinations and in different numbers. And that's what happens in the case of uh, penicillin C gene, uh, uh, in which there is a um, uh, great, a, a big chunk of uh, alternative region uh, included, and basically the antibody against this uh, region has been used to uh, improve the diagnosis of glioblastomas. Another example is the CD44 gene, um, which is notorious for its uh, um, complex splicing. It has 10 internal alternative axons, and as I said, they are spliced in different numbers and in, in different uh, combinations. And there was a precedent of using an antibody against a specific splice variant, including variant exon 6, uh, to treat the head and neck carcinoma. Unfortunately, it didn't pass the um, phase 1 trial because of the high toxicity. But still, there is a, mm, a precedent of using splice isoform specific uh, treatments. So, um, and as I mentioned, uh, before, uh, back at LBNL, we've been studying um, the splicing patterns in breast cancer, and we had an excellent model system comprised of uh, a panel of breast cancer cell lines, uh, which really uh, recapitulate um, the aberrations both on genomic and expression level that take place uh, in tumors. And so, um, um, so the breast cancer cell lines um, expression patterns show distinct uh, clusters, uh, and those clusters actually 
uh, correspond to basal B, basal A, and luminal cells, which are uh, cells of slightly different phenotype, with basal B cells being most aggressive cells, uh, stem cell-like cells. And so uh, when we try to measure the um, uh, 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 the, uh, to detect the uh, splicing repertoire of the CD44 gene, which is actually a stem cell marker within those cells, we could clearly see um, the agreement between the RDPCR and our predictions from microarrays, and we saw a completely different pattern of splicing within basal Bs and basal As and luminals, uh, luminal cell lines. What, what was really attractive about this gene, basically, is that uh, the alternative region this is a transmembrane protein, and the alternative region happens to be located on the cell surface and outside of the cell. So it is very much uh, possible to use it both as diagnostic and therapeutic targets using a uh, splice isoform specific antibodies, for example. So uh, how is it possible to um, explore uh, splicing? Um, uh, in the global uh, scale, on the whole genome, whole transcriptome scale? And the answer is using microarray platforms and uh, more so using uh, whole transcriptome uh, shotgun sequencing or um, RNA-seq uh, technologies. So, but with, uh, with um, I will just uh, briefly mention the microarray platforms that are around for this uh, type of studies. Um, there are two types of uh, platforms that can be used for interrogation of splicing. Both of them are subgene level, uh, and one of them uh, are exon level based, and others are rather junction uh, based. So there are advantages and disadvantages of both platforms. Uh, so, for example, uh, this platform by Affymetrix, the human exon chip uh, 1.0 ST uh, that has been introduced a few years ago, um, it covers um, a great um, um, chunk of uh, human transcriptome, uh, both known and predicted, and uh, mostly the probes are targeting exonic regions. And so, uh, with regard to the um, coverage of a human transcriptome, this is really a uh, very valuable tool for a discovery of uh, novel splice events that have not uh, been detected anywhere else before, and that is the advantage of this platform. Disadvantage of this platform is a uh, great deal of noise because of uh, really dense um, um, and really um, huge content that is present on the array. And um, moreover, it is, it is really a challenge to um, reconstruct the splice isoform structures because you are basically measuring the exome level intensities or exome level expression um, for every gene uh, in the human uh, genome. But at the same time, you don't know which exon is connected to which exon. And this is a little bit of a challenge here. But uh, still, I, I still believe that this is a very good discovery tool because um, it just gives you an opportunity to explore uh, any combination of any axons that might exist out there. Uh, the other platform is the junction, uh, axon junction-based platforms, and those actually probe both uh, exonic regions and junction regions. Uh, and so they give you a much clearer um, signal, much less noise, and they are um, uh, giving you um, more information as to what particular structure of a transcript you are dealing with in a particular sample. But at the same time, the design is limited to a, a splice events that have been already known or observed in some, uh, in some sources. So I, um, I think this is a little bit of a uh, downside of this uh, platform. Do you have any questions for this part? No? So you're saying that the junction arrays don't take into account like a junction that is an exon 1 and exon 4? If it, it, if, it, if it hasn't been known before, then no. No. So I would say that this is more of a discovery tool. And this is more of a validation tool. Are there, are there data sets that are um, available in the world? 
Well, I think there are for, for the mouse. And um, um, it's going to be um, uh, the, the data set for the breast cancer cell lines is going to be available pretty soon. So. So as I mentioned, um, uh, a number of statistical approaches uh, have been published uh, to um, explore and to infer a splicing pattern uh, from microarray data. And this is an excellent review that uh, gives you a state of uh, affairs in this build. Uh, I'm not going to focus on different um, methodologies right now. I'm just going to mention briefly of the method that we've uh, developed back at LVNL. Um, where uh, we um, participated in the um, uh, TCGA project uh, profiling uh, multiple cancer types with uh, subgene level platforms. And basically, uh, this uh, approach uh, allows you to see the differential axon expression rather than differential gene expression. So, uh, for example, um, so just to give you an overview of the whole pipeline of this computational approach is that you measure the axon level expression and then you derive from it the gene level expression and then you apply some sort of filtering which was really essential uh, as uh, our experience uh, showed. And then you apply two, uh, two um, separate uh, detection uh, algorithms, the splicing index and FERMA um, in combination, and that gives you a list of uh, highly likely uh, candidates of um, differential splicing in this case. So what it shows you here is the profile of expression of a single gene across different samples, and along the x-axis you see the um, um, different probe sets, and this is the expression level. <clears throat> and the same layout is for this heat map, but it, it, this one uh, is completely different uh, measurement. This comes out from FERMA, uh, and I can give you the reference if you're interested in this. Uh, so basically, what it shows you here is that the expression of, of the entire gene is basically pretty tight. When you uh, correct for the overall gene expression differences, you see that um, all the probes uh, actually follow the same trend um, within the majority, uh, within the main part of the gene. But within some narrow region of the gene, you see a great variance of expression of a particular probe set that probe particular junctions or axons. And that is also reflected in this method, too. And so these are the candidates of the differential expression. So in this case, we measured the expression of uh, two isoforms, including and excluding a single cassette axon. So this is just one of the methods and uh, uh, if you just look at the literature um, it's been a little bit of challenge to um, infer splicing uh, using microarray data because of the uh, high level of noise and the validation rate uh, of different uh, methods range from some 30 percent up to 80 percent. Bless you. Um, and with this method, we were able to achieve a validation success rate of over 80%. So we've been really happy with it. So splicing um, is, uh, as I said, is very tightly regulated process. And uh, the good thing about it is that we see not only tumor-specific splice signatures, but also uh, tumor subtype-specific splicing signatures. And this is a... Um, uh, a picture from uh, our study of breast cancer cell lines, and you can see that three major subclasses of breast cancer show a specific splicing pattern. And as I said, these are excellent candidates for a novel biomarkers. This comes from our study of breast cancer using breast cancer cell lines panel. This is junction array. This is junction array. Yeah. And so, um, just to give you a little bit of um, biology here with regard to the uh, splicing and transcription regulation, um, it's been noted several times in the literature that basically transcription regulation and splicing regulation 
act in parallel, meaning that in the same cells, uh, transcription regulation and splicing regulation may target, say, the same pathways, but through totally different genes. So these are two parallel uh, mechanisms of regulation of cellular processes. And that's what we were able to see in the uh, breast cancer study. Uh, you see um, the enrichment of a certain pathways with either alternative, alternatively spliced genes with red color and differentially expressed genes. And you see that the pathways enriched with these two groups of genes are totally different. And so this is not and there was um, virtually there was uh, zero overlap between the those groups of genes, so that was very um, comforting to see in this case. And uh, this is not only a fundamental um, um, a, a question of fundamental interest, but it also can guide you with uh, um, your efforts uh, with regard to the search of novel biomarkers. So, for example, if you are interested in these pathways you would rather use platforms that allow you to measure the overall gene expression differences. And uh, on, on the contrary, if you are interested in these pathways, you would rather focus on research of splicing than uh, differential gene expression. And uh, I didn't mention it before, but if you are actually using just these platforms uh, that measure overall gene expression differences, you basically risk to overlook the alternative splice events and you miss a great chunk of uh, information that can be used for development of uh, novel biomarkers. So what is it? Well, so so the usual uh, strategy that I, the strategy that I would take is that I would look at both, because um, um, very often it happens that you observe both a splicing change and change in overall expression. But uh, but um, you can use a single platform for both purposes. So, um, as I mentioned before, in that pipeline, you can use the subgene level platform, and uh, you would get an axon or junction level uh, um, signal, and you can basically derive the overall gene or gene expression levels from that platform by averaging across all the probes at the probe particular gene. And so, you just work with the data from the same platform. But um, I would I would concentrate on these two different um, analyses separately. So I would I would look for the differentially expressed genes. This is one part, and I would concentrate on the um, splicing differences. This is another part because um, you understand that, and it, it's pretty straightforward. You look for the differentially expressed gene, and there you go, right? But at the same time, if you don't see the differential expression you tend to throw those genes away. But it's not necessarily um, the right thing to do, because if you look into the splicing patterns of those genes that are more or less constant in expression over your sample, you may discover something really new and important. Yeah. So um, just to, um, uh, to um, tell you a little bit more, what is the importance and value of alternative splicing in clinical application? So imagine that you have a, um, a transcript isoforms coming out of this gene with a cassette axon right there, and there are two isoforms excluding and including the alternative axon, and then um, two protein isoforms are uh, translated from these products. Uh, and you can imagine having an antibody against the common part of those proteins, and then you are able to pull out all uh, isoforms of that gene, all protein isoforms. But then you can imagine uh, raising an antibody against an alternative region. 
And in that case, you would be targeting a specific splice isoform. And as I mentioned, there are isoforms that are cancer promoting and there are isoforms that are uh, characteristic to the normal state of cells and you would rather target the ones that are a culprit here. And so with all this arsenal can be used in clinical applications for both diagnostic, prognostic and uh, therapeutic purposes. So hopefully with uh, these few slides I have convinced you that this is really important. And now I can take questions if there are any. Oh yeah, you can, you can, yeah. So as Sora mentioned, with uh, with this new technology, it's basically possible to to do all sorts of studies uh, with uh, regard to the whole genome and whole transcriptome, including splicing as well. Yeah, there are going to be different approaches there uh, with regard to the detection, of course, huh? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so basically, um, basically, uh, when you measure, um, when you when you deal with uh, with the reads count information, right, you derive a um, read count data, right, and then um, this is post mapping onto some reference. So your reference can be a genome, as Sora mentioned, right, and then your reference can be a collection of different junctions. And so, for example, you can create in silico a database um, of possible of all possible junctions or of the junctions that you're interested in and you can map your sequencing data onto that collection and so that's how you profile the expression level of, um, of those junctions and at this point it reduces to the same uh, step of analysis as it was here with microarray. So, so the So I think this is actually uh, another another reason for optimism is that you know this is another type of um, feature that hasn't traditionally been probed, uh, uh, and and so uh, this is this is kind of um, it's not new biology but it's um, it's probably uh, new new ways of, of looking at um, cases that uh, um, you know we've, we already have interest in. And so uh, uh, th th this is potentially a, a very, very lucrative and um, avenue for, for biomarker discovery. So thank you for taking us through that. Okay, so not lunch yet. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so how many people um, did their homework? <laughs> Did you read this? How many people read the paper? Okay, so a few that didn't. Okay, that's okay. Um, if you can get a chance to look at it um, during lunch, then that would be useful, I think. I think useful for you. Um, and certainly during the lab, um, you know, you could take a little bit of time to look at the paper itself. So um, this is a, a paper published by Joe Gray's group um, in Cancer Cell in 2006. Um, and uh, uh, 
this, the, basically what I want to take you through um, in this little uh, remaining half hour is give you an overview of the study, uh, what were the goals and the biological questions, um, the, uh, introduce the breast cancer expression subtypes, uh, introduce the data types and data sets that were generated in the study, uh, and then talk about how those were related to clinical outcome. So just some background on um, when we were designing this course, uh, I had this idea that uh, it would be a good idea to take a model paper, a paper of some kind um, that, that um, would really did um, integrate clinical data and, and genomic data, um, uh, and one that would allow us to uh, illustrate the concepts that we wanted to illustrate. So this paper was published at the end of 2006, so it already has 206 citations, so it has reasonably high impact. People are reading it, citing it. Um, the, the really nice feature about this paper is that it contains uh, the concepts that um, are, are nearly always encountered in large-scale clinical genomic studies. Um, a really nice bonus feature is that um, this has integrated analysis of copy number and expression. So um, tumor, the hallmark of tumors is our copy number. Uh, it's not always associated with the uh, copy number is um, actually more often than not not associated with the expression of the genes that are contained. Um, and, and this paper kind of describes how they navigated through that landscape. Uh, a very important part of this is that the data and the clinical phenotypes were clinically available or freely available. Um, this is rare. This is hard to find. And so, um, so, so this is a, a beautiful um, data set for that. So um, one of, a few of the limitations, there are some limitations to this paper. Um, we can't, of course, um, the quintessential paper probably doesn't exist. Um, is that the data is generated pretty much on older uh, and, and I would say obsolete platforms, but um, that doesn't mean that uh, the concepts aren't, aren't similar. The concepts are very, very uh, are the same. It's just that um, the data that you may be generating today uh, will be probably denser and um, higher dimensional than, uh, than, than the data sets in this lab. And nonetheless, uh, I think it's worthwhile um, pursuing this. So the goals of the study were to identify genomic events uh, in breast cancer um, that can be assayed to better stratify patients according to clinical behavior. Uh, so um, the second goal is to develop insights into how molecular aberrations contribute to breast cancer pathogenesis. And finally, it was to discover genes that uh, may be therapeutic targets uh, in patients that do not respond well to current therapies. So any questions before we jump into this? OK, okay so here is a figure uh, showing the expression subtypes in, in breast cancer. So here what you have is you have uh, samples or patients clustered along the top here. And you have genes uh, ordered along the side here. This is from the supplementary data. I don't know if anyone um, was, was really keen and went to the supplementary data, but um, uh, uh, this is where this is from. OK, and so um, what, what I wanted to point out here is that um, there, there are four breast cancer subtypes shown here, um, the, the, the fifth being um, normal-like, um, so that's excluded here. But um, here we have uh, the luminal A subtype. Um, here's the luminal B subtype, um, here's the basal subtype, and then here's the uh, ERB2 subtype. Okay? And uh, the important thing to note <coughs> is that uh, the, these genes here in, in the luminal A's, um, these are, uh, these, basically, um, for these particular cases over here, uh, these genes are highly expressed, and over here, uh, uh, sorry, these are lowly expressed, and these are highly expressed over here. Okay. Um, here you have a pattern of uh, 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 of low expressors uh, of these genes um, in, in in these patients here, 
And, um, and then finally, you have a big block over here uh, where these genes are, um, are highly expressed uh, in, the, uh, in the basal subtype um, and not uh, in the rat. And finally, the, for the ERB2, um, it, it's a it's a much more um, it's much more related. So so you, here you have uh, many many features that um, contribute to the differences in, in cases. Um, for this, it's it's actually a relatively small number of features, a small number of genes that, that contribute to the difference. And and actually, I mean in in, in reality, it's probably just one, um, which is ERB2 itself or HER2 itself. So. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do in the lab is uh, use this package called Gene Filter. Um, by the way, sort of these annotations are not on the original slide, so you can um, scribble these in if you want. Um, so we're going to figure out how to take um, a list of 22,000 features in our original uh, data set, and, uh, and we're going to learn how to collapse those down to about 100 or less um, using a package called Gene Filter. Uh, and then we're going to try to reproduce this plot um, using hierarchical clustering um, after feature selection, and this is with the, with the cluster package. And these are all these are packages in, in R and Bioconductor. Um, so the, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that uh, the, the subtyping also um, what's annotated here are um, are the ER status. So this is estrogen receptor, uh, and these are ER uh, ER positives and ER negatives. So one of the things that is really nice about the study is that um, it has this matched data set uh, for copy number. Okay, so what the, what the investigators did is first subclass all the patients um, according to these gene expression subtypes, so basal, ERB2, luminal A, and luminal B. And then um, based on that, they were able to look within those subtypes and see if there were um, copy number patterns that uh, were potentially contributing to those to those subtypes. Um, so here uh, I've shown um, a uh, this is a figure from the paper. Um, this is looking at all cases and it's looking at the frequency of gain that goes above this line uh, and the so or amplification and the frequency of loss uh, which or deletion uh, which goes below the line. So this gives you kind of an overall portrait of, uh, of, the, of the cohort. So it gives you a kind of a, a summary view of what um, the, this, this population looks like from a copy number perspective. And, and this is very similar to the plot I showed uh, earlier in the day um, based on our, uh, our larger cohort. So, um, so this is a reproducible, um, certainly a reproducible frequency plot um, that uh, that is kind of accepted now in, in breast cancer research, in the breast cancer community. So uh, the, the other thing to note here is that what they've done is plot here the high-level amplification. So there are some genes like ERB2 that are, uh, that are targeted with many, many copy number amplifications. So, so you get um, huge reproduction. And so here is a, um, is a frequency plot of, uh, of high-level amplifications. And uh, essentially, the, um, there are uh, well-known and well-characterized. Uh, this is our B2 here. Okay. Uh, all right. So then, uh, this is again the whole population. If we take the subtypes, we look at the basal subtypes. Uh, we can then plot a frequency diagram um, for the basal subtypes, and it has uh, it ha does have some slightly different um, characteristics. And um, in particular, uh, some of the, the high-level copy, copy number alterations are, are sort of um, uh, more specific to, to basal than in others. Um, here you have the ERB2, and uh, what's striking is that, of course, well, um, here's your ERB2, and uh, it's present uh, in, in almost 80% of those cases. Okay, and then, then the, and then the rest of the uh, alterations are at relatively low frequency. The high, high level ones. And, and then you have the luminal A's and the luminal B's. And so what we will do is actually uh, we're going to take this array CDH data. We're going to uh, load it in. We're going to analyze it for copy number changes. And we're going to um, use the, the phenotype database that we have 
um, to subgroup the cases, and we're going to plot these frequency diagrams. So we're going to try to reproduce this figure in the lab. Okay. So the other important thing that they did in this paper was to um, perform unsupervised clustering based on the copy number. Um, and essentially what they found is that uh, the samples fall into uh, three groups, um, which they define as uh, 1Q, 16Q amplification. Um, then you have uh, the, this kind of um, amplifying group, which contains um, a lot of samples with high-level amplifications. So what this figure shows is um, in, uh, in green, you have uh, so, so there's a lot of color swapping that happens, unfortunately. But um, so sometimes um, in gene expression, uh, the uh, sometimes in um, sorry sometimes in, in copy number, um, green is actually shown. Uh, green means loss. In this case, it means gain. So um, so here you have uh, gains of, of one Q, and you have um, and then in this group here, you have these yellow dots. And what the yellow dots mean um, are high-level amplifications. So these are kind of uh, extra annotations um, put onto the plots to show you where the high-level amplifications are. And, and so we're going to use a package that, uh, that, that, can, that can actually reproduce this, this data as well. And so you learn how to um, uh, copy, uh, basically um, superimpose the, um, the, the high-level amplifications. Um, for, for visual analysis, and then also we're going to um, we're going to cluster these samples as well using uh, using the package uh, ACGH, and uh, and so again um, they fall into these three groups. And um, one thing just to just to watch out for in the lab is um, you're going to get a result, and uh, I want you to try to think about you know, how closely it matches this result. It's the same data. It's uh, it's it's um, similar analysis, um, but I just think be aware of that. Um, what you're going to get might look different. It might look the same, but just be be cognizant of the fact that um, we want to try to compare these results. Okay. Um, okay. So that's that's that section of the paper. Any questions so far? So does everyone understand this plot? So here we have um, here we have basically the chromosomal position here, uh, and this is chromosome one, two, three, four, five, etc., down to X. Okay, and um, the 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 tools that um, you'll use actually um, will plot the data like this. So um, so you're gonna have to turn your either turn your paper or turn your computer or turn your head, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the three. Okay, so just be a, the yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of games. That's right. So, so here you have the patients um, are, are are along the top here. Okay? okay. And so you have all these patients have a gain of one Q. Okay. Okay. I was okay. Yeah. Okay. Does everyone understand that? And then here you have um, this group has. Here's chromosome 17 again, and here's high-level amplifications of ERB2. So these are the patients. All these patients have ERB2, and they get grouped together. OK? OK, so then, um, Sorry, there are yeah. Sorry, to the copy number the expression set Yeah, so, so that's right. So um, uh, this. Right, so what's here is the expression subtype. Okay, so this is then superimposed. You do unsupervised clustering of the copy number, and then they superimposed um, the expression subtypes on top of it. And um, well, some of it's clean, some of it's not. Right, so um, here you have the basals that are pretty much grouped together, um, and uh, you know you can make an argument that um, that the luminal A's are, uh, are are grouped together, but then you get kind of a, a you know, confused mix in the middle, and um, I think actually the authors overstate this in the paper. That's my my um, my feeling is that uh, uh, that they recover the um, the subtypes, but um, 
that, that, that doesn't seem to be. Is, is, there, is there a quantitative way to compare the two computations? Um, sure. I mean, you can do correlation analysis of, of, of the, the subgroups of the copy number to the subgroups of the number. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Pardon me? Uh, no, I don't think they did that. They just did the buying uh, sort of visual interpretation. Um, okay, so um, here we have uh, survival analysis. Okay, so this is gonna actually going to be work that you're going to do tomorrow, um, and Anna's going to lead you through this. Um, uh, she was actually involved in this study, which is actually another real big bonus of, uh, of using this study because she can provide insight um, that, that most um, wouldn't be able to do. So, uh, so here you have uh, the expression subtypes um, that show differential survival. So uh, that's, quite, um, that's quite striking. I, think, I believe these are the basils here. Okay, so they have much uh, the inferior survival rates. These are Kaplan-Meier plots. And uh, so you will learn how to do these. And, and actually, uh, ahead of the lab, you learn all the, um, um, the concepts that go into producing these plots in the first place, and the statistics that go into determining whether um, one survival curve is different from another survival curve. Okay. So that's the, um, there is a clinical component of our clinical genomics workshop. It's, it's, it's that part. And that, that'll, be, um, that'll be covered tomorrow. Um, so, uh, so, so here you have those three copy number subtypes, and um, and so they show that there's there's differential survival in uh, in, in, um, in the ones that uh, I can't. I believe that these are uh, the complex and the amplifying, and then these are the others. Um, so. Then, uh, then we have cases that showed recurrent high-level amplifications, and uh, uh, and those that didn't. So here you have an inferior survival of those that uh, showed recurrent amplification versus those that didn't. And then here, um, I think this is one of the really neat um, findings of this paper is that you have these expression subtypes that are kind of accepted uh, almost as dogma in the, in the breast cancer um, uh, in the breast cancer world. And, uh, and what this data shows, and, and albeit on a small number of cases, um, that th these can actually be, these subtypes can be further split um, in terms of um, the outcome data. And so uh, here you have those that ha are luminal A's but also have um, high level amplifications, uh, and those that are luminal A's that don't have high level amplifications. And so uh, it shows that you can split these subtypes. And so um, again, this is uh, looking into uh, into the prospective um, biomarker discovery. So this this gives us some indication that um, there's an association even within a, a tightly defined subgroup by one method. You use a different um, orthogonal assay um, that that measures something different. One can potentially split um, uh, a subtype. So it's, this is a really nice. Um, uh, finding, I think, in this paper. Um, and then you have uh, the two, two remaining survival curves related to amplifications of 8P. Do you have anything to add so far, Anna? No? Okay. okay. So there, there was a point of trying to prove that there was a correlation between the. That's like, that's like the yeah. 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 Is it better than right. just getting a correlation, which should right. be. You can split it. Yeah. In fact, you wouldn't get a correlation, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what they don't want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So then, finally, um, then then there's this plot here, uh, which uh, shows that if you take the copy number out, um, so you take the the, the non-induced copy number, um, actually there's still there's still um, uh, the, the subtypes are, are somewhat. Preserve. So, um, so basically, adding copy number helps to 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 split. But even without it, you, you, we still recover the, the subtypes. Okay. So, any comments on the paper? So, what what were people's impression of the paper? I'd be interested to hear um, those who those who had a chance to read it. Um, was it uh, something that you thought was interesting? Was it something that um, you thought was well done. It had what were the caveats, limitations? Any any comments?
people are reading it now. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it, it seems that way. Again, it's it's a small cohort, so that needs to be reproduced, and um, that's something that we're in our own research going to try to reproduce. Um, certainly, you know, we're looking for that. So, kind of adding another layer of analysis of the patient, so that yeah. way they would be able to better predict the the outcome. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly points to that. And the, yeah. the other thing is that they point out that they. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so I think they they, they listed um, a, a large number of genes that um, they think are potential targets uh, based on, on association with amplification and expression. Um, and so, um, there's pre presumably, there's a lot of follow up going on with that. Um, so actually, the biomarker problem, biomarker, the, the problem with the biomarker is that you always link with the sensitivity and sensitivity and with the predicted positive values, predicted negative values. And those are the clinical ones, the interesting ones, which are the predicted values. And those change so much with the, with the, with the background of the population. So mm -hmm. it's always, it, it's never going to be a, the perfect uh, thing because then there will be never anything with 100% predicted positive predicted value or 100 percent negative predicted value. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that finding the targets for therapy on those patients that they find that have those outbreaks are the, the most yeah. important outcomes on the therapy side of course. Yeah, so, so I, I, I think I actually agree with you on there. The, um, the issue is that, uh, again, you're dealing with maybe 10, you've got 10 cases, you know, some 10, 10 15 cases that have the high level implications. So your case numbers are so small. Um, of course, you, then you need to just build up case numbers. So you, you filter down the biomarker set, but now you need to do the other side, which is to expand the, the patient cohort set. Yeah. Please. Uh, sure. So let's talk about limitations. <laughs> so uh, certainly, that's uh, I think that's an issue, and um, and, and also um, so so this speaks to um, why I think these clustering and biomarker discovery um, studies are often not reproducible, it is because um, tumor samples are difficult to study. Um, and it's because, uh, it's for the, thanks for bringing up those points, I mean, we have normal cells mixed in, you have heterogeneous clonal populations um, that are mixed in, and, uh, and so there's a lot of um, biological noise in the system. And so that's often um, a case, uh, that's often contributes to, uh, to variation and, uh, and lack of reproducibility in, the, in these studies. And, and so there are techniques like um, uh, laser capture um, microdissection and uh, laser microdissection. And, um, those are, those are um, I think, the better the sample preparation, the better your study is going to be. That's, that's the general rule, I think, is that if you invest time up front, the data that comes out um, will be better, and often some you know, there's a saying that we say in um, in computer science that like garbage in, garbage out, um, and uh, so so you want to try to to really um, purify your samples as much as possible. I think that's a then you lose clinical validity. Clinical, right. you lose clinical validity because then if you want to use it as a tool, as a clinical tool, yeah, you're not going to be able to. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Everybody, okay? that's right. And so it's not going to be applicable from the thing. Sure, but, but you go if you get closer to the biology, though, yeah. so so right. So That's if you if you if you have pure samples and cleaner data, you get closer to the biology, then yeah. then maybe you can um, uh, it has a better chance for clinical utility. Yeah. Um, so there's one thing that's missing that nobody's picked up on. Yes. But it 
may identify a signal. Right? So that I think the the the, the uh, point is is that um, laser capture may uh, or cleaner samples in general may identify the signal. Um, then, 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 then you can still use the sig you can still try to find the signal in in, in noisy samples. Yeah. But then you can use other techniques to get to capture the signal. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. More specific techniques. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So you do much more targeted, lower throughput assays once you found the signal. Um, and uh, okay. So so there's one one other point that I, before we take lunch that I really want to discuss about this paper. Um, I wonder if anybody has any other comments. If we'll hit on it. So what about validation? So they use, they use these high throughput um, techniques to determine high level copy number alterations, um, but didn't validate using tried and true techniques like FISH, for example. Um, so does that mean that it's less believable? Well, I think what, that the power of having two data sets is really quite nice, um, because that, that's in some way, that's actually a validation in itself, because um, you're seeing um, concomitant um, up up levels of uh, in DNA and expression um, that gives you pretty good in indication and can cut down noise considerably. But um, at the end of the day, I think um, uh, one would still need to uh, to look at at least a few of these cases um, using, for example, fl fluorescence in situ hybridization of uh, the copy number amplifications to make sure that in fact that they're there. So uh, so that's just um, a limitation that uh, that I notice. But. The, the other previous studies about it, uh, yeah. Data. Right. So that's so People you can. Able to about numbers, about so orthogonal data sets that are also a, a, certainly a, a, a very reasonable way because um, it's it's a it's an external cohort of patients and uh, and and uh, if you can validate it in external cohorts that are produced in different labs using maybe different microarray uh, platform, then then that's that's also a, a form of validation. Um, Okay, so um, just a preview of the lab before we go for lunch. So, so we are going to look at these expression subtypes, and we're going to do feature selection and clustering methods. Um, we are going to, do, to determine copy number profiles based on the array CGH. Um, we're going to try to find copy number subtypes. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to do association with outcome by, using, by plotting survival curves um, and, uh, and looking at um, how we can um, uh, uh, do that type of analysis um, and, and look at uh, parameters that were associated with outcome. So, uh, so basically, you know, this is just a review of the paper. Um, uh, and uh, again, so if you haven't looked at it already, I encourage you to do so.